Hello dear brothers and sisters, welcome to the studio of the Ministerial Department and the Savage School Department. We would like to study the new lesson for our next week uh, with the help of the Lord. And I am uh, happy to present to you the participant this time with us will be our dear Pastor Henry Daring and he is with us in video you can see him now welcome brother henry daring thank you so much thank, thank you for thank inviting me to take part, part in the sabbath school, school study, study. Hey, brother it. brother henry daring is sitting in california in sacramento right now and we are participating together it's uh, praise the lord uh, we have this possibility to connect people from different uh, parts of the world and we would like to begin our study uh, this evening uh, with the help of the Lord. And we would like to begin with a silent prayer. Amen. <clears throat> the title of our lesson is witness, judge, and advocate. Uh, you can uh, see, dear brothers and sisters, that the lessons in, uh, and all the time are going around Jesus Christ. He's uh, uh, as an intercessor. <clears throat> we studied that in the last lesson. He's our inter intercessor. He's our uh, advocate. He's our representative. Uh, he has so many functions in the plan of salvation, and uh, this is why also in Revelation, our Lord Jesus Christ is called Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning, he's the end, he's everything actually in our salvation. And this new lesson now is going to, <coughs> excuse me, this new lesson uh, now is going to touch the point of Jesus Christ as a witness, judge, and advocate. We would like to, um, to consider the introduction testimony. I have here just portion of it. It says, the world has been committed to Christ and through him has came every blessing from God to the fallen race. He was the Redeemer before as after His incarnation. This is important point to understand that uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, He was our representative and our advocate even before, before He was here on earth, before His resurrection. Uh, all the time we, we own our lives and our existence to Him and to His intercession. We would like to have a short uh, review on the under titles in our lesson. We have one under title, Jesus as the Faithful Witness, right from the beginning. And we're going to see Jesus as a witness, Jesus as an advocate, and Jesus as a judge. These three main uh, topics will be the, uh, the red line on our lesson. And as always, I used to remind you, be careful not to spend too much time on the first questions and leave some more time to the last questions because these are the central points that can be very useful for our visitors and our brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Now we would like to uh, go forwards and to begin uh, commenting on the uh, first question. The first question is, uh, what very significant name of Christ is found in Revelation chapter 1, 5 and Revelation 3, 14? And I will be very happy if we can... Uh, connect here brother Henry Daring and uh, Pastor Daring he can comment on the first questions welcome brother Henry what thank do you, you thank think? You. Happy I could join you 
for this particular study. Well, Christ is a faithful witness. He's also a true witness. What is a witness? What is your definition of a witness? One who furnishes some kind of evidence. Okay? One who can give a first-hand account of something seen, heard, and also has experience. And Jesus has first-hand experience in everything that he did in the past, the present, and also he, he has He's going to be a faithful witness to the future also. He's always been faithful. There's no unrighteousness in Jesus Christ. And, he's, and it's very significant that we understand that, this concept, that he is a witness. He has the evidence. He has seen it. He has heard it. He has experienced it. He's come down to this sin polluted earth and also experienced Temptation, as, as we are going through temptation day by day. So he's a remarkable God that we serve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Uh, I would like that we consider here a little bit um, the testimony, which is in uh, Manuscript Release, uh, Volume 18. It says, One thing will be certainly be understood, from the study of Revelation that the connection between God and his people is close and decided. John writes, Grace be unto you, and peace from him which is and which was and become is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the praise of the king on earth, and the prince of the king of earth. It's interesting that in this, um, we had the presentation of Jesus Christ in different places with different names. But in this place in Revelation, Jesus is presented as the faithful witness. And uh, why is Jesus faithful witness? What do you think, Brother Henry Daring? Why is he such a faithful witness that he deserved to have this name as a faithful witness. Well, he's, he's always, always been faithful, faithful from, from the very, very beginning. beginning. Uh, 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 since, uh, there, there, God has, has no beginning. beginning. God, God will have no, no end. end. He's, he's, he's not unfaithful. We find many times in court, court cases, people are very unfaithful. They're witnesses, but they're lying. Jesus is Always, always tells, tells the truth. truth. Yes, he amen. Never told, he, has he has never told, told one lie. lie. We, we can trust him. him. There's, There's somebody, somebody else who is a liar, and that is Satan himself, the arch enemy of Jesus Christ. He is always telling lies, but Jesus will always, always tell the truth, tell the and that truth. tells us something. We need to tell the truth. We need to follow the good example of Jesus Christ and be faithful. Thank you very much. It's interesting that Jesus is a faithful witness, as, as Pastor Daring says here, because he doesn't lie. He's, uh, uh, he's God. He cannot lie. He cannot transgress the law of God. He has proven that. But I think also because uh, he's the only one from the divinity that crossed the line and become a human, which means that he came in person here on earth. So he can testify also by his own experience how is to be human, what means to be tempted. He can testify how the work of Satan works because I can imagine that a lot of the fallen angels, they have no idea really uh, the, uh, the, of the holy angels. I mean the holy angels, they have not so much idea how the temptation and how powerful the sin is and all these kind of things. And uh, Jesus Christ is a faithful witness. He can testify that. And he testified as a faithful witness to the court. But at the same time, he testified to us as a faithful witness for the divine things. Because nobody of us have been part of the divinity, but now we have one that become human but he was also God so he testified to us also and give a testimony how divinity is 
and what shall we do to become part of this heavenly family? Wonderful. It's a very nice lesson. We would like to continue now to the and see the next uh, question. Let me see if we can... Yeah, now it's visible. <clears throat> Second question. We will hide Brother Henry Daring for a while. And in what manner does the faithful witness address the church of Laodicea? Now, the second question is not just the witnessing of Jesus in the front of the court, but now this faithful witness give a, give a message, give testimony to the churches. And, and now we are to the uh, uh, studying, or we are going to study the message to the last period of the church history. And uh, here is uh, Brother Henry Daring back to us. What do you think, Brother Henry Daring, what, how is it, uh, uh, what is the message to Laodicea saying, well, Revelation 3.15? Yes, God, God, Jesus has a very serious, serious message, message to give to the Laodiceans, to the last church period, the seventh church period that started in 1844. And the message is, I know your works. He doesn't say, I know your profession, I know what you're doing. You're neither cold, you're neither hot, he says. He says, God says, be hot or be cold, but don't be lukewarm. And if we're lukewarm, God will spew us out of his mouth. And this is what many Christians today, in this period, they're in a state of lukewarmness. Uh, if you go to Laodicea today, about six miles from Laodicea, there's another place of, of called Herapolis. And from Herapolis, there, there are hot streams, hot water coming out. And they, during, during 2,000 years ago, water would flow through aqueducts from this hot place, Herapolis, all the way to Laodicea. And when the when water arrived, arrived in Laodicea, it was, it was lukewarm. It was, you could say, unfit to drink. People usually like um, hot tea, herbal tea, or a cold glass of water. People don't generally like something that is lukewarm. And God said, you're blind. You're totally blind to your shortcomings. You're blind to your sins. And you think you're in a, a good situation. And you're proud also. So there's so a message, message that's, that's hard-hitting, hard -hitting. and, it's, and, and God, God wants, wants to wake, wake up the people that live in this lay at the same period, period, especially God's, God's people. people. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I would like to uh, that we address also another perspective of this, and that's more in the verse 17. And uh, I'm sure that the brothers and sisters in many churches will comment a lot on this point. Don't forget to leave some time for the end of the lesson. Uh, in verse 17 says, Because you say I'm rich and, 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 and increase it with goods, uh, and I have need of nothing. Uh, that is another part of the message to Laodicea, the proudness of Laodicea. Uh, it, and uh, I'm very glad uh, Pastor Henry Daring just mentioned about the real Laodicea, which is located in Turkey right now. And uh, I, <coughs> I have the privilege to be there too. And it's interesting that uh, there was, um, in approximately that age, a very heavy earthquake that destroyed almost the whole city of Laodicea. And because Laodicea was such an important uh, place for the merchandise and the merchandise way, uh, the, uh, the Roman emperor sent a message that he's willing to donate a lot of gold to rebuild Laodicea uh, because of the earthquake. But the answer of Laodiceans people was no. We don't need help. We have enough money. We are rich. We have, we have enough. 
So it, there are historical documents that really prove the proudness of the Laodicean people because they were selling uh, exactly from this mineral water that runs there. They were doing medicine and, and, uh, and they were selling that and also they had very special black ships and uh, the wool uh, the the wool of the ships were very was very expensive too and everything was was produced there was very very high quality and uh, these people were very rich but now the question is that in the last period of time god see the church of god very proud <clears throat> what's the testimony says here is also important to be considered. <clears throat> uh, let me see and read some lines here. We cannot touch the whole things, but it says here, <coughs> especially the second testimony, uh, the true witness says <clears throat> of a cold, lifeless, uh, Christless church. It's very interesting just these words to be considered. The, the witness says it's a cold, it's a life less, have no life, and it's a Christ less church. It's a church that theoretically appealed to Christ, theoretically uh, have uh, aware the name of Christ but have no in reality have no Christ in the church and Christ in their lives. It's very tragical, the situation of Laodicea. It is really a message that has to uh, hit us and to make us to consider this, uh, this um, serious message. Brother Henry Daring, you have something to add to the second question? <clears throat> Yeah, I just, just want to look at the, the, the ancient city of Laodicea. It was a very wealthy and a very prosperous city. It's, it's fame spread, spread far, far and wide for three reasons. reasons. It, it was, was a financial and also a banking center. Okay. <laughs> okay. It was a, I can mention it already. It was, it was a clothing manufacturing center. that it produced black wool. wool. Mm -hmm. Third point, it... it, 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 it it was a location of a famous medical school known for eye and ear operations that the doctors performed. And they had a special eye salve, or a special, okay. special powder. That they That's produced, right. That they manufactured, and it went all over the world. So it was a very prosperous, wealthy city. And, 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 and God, God said, said here, here, you're, you're poor. poor. <laughs> you may be wealthy material, but you're poor in spirit. What else? You're blind. They didn't see their spiritual condition. That's God is right. looking at the spiritual condition of the people. Not so much what they have, materially speaking. And uh, they were miserable, wretched. And, and, and of course, they have need of nothing. They were totally self-sufficient, content with what, whatever they had. How is it today? People don't see their spiritual condition. They don't realize that they are sinners before God, and they need Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we can uh, move already to the next question, and that is question three. Uh, we can see here actually what is the uh, what is the the counsel uh, which the faithful witness gave. I think it's a also well-known Bible verse, but uh, it's uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, try the fire, and thou mayst be rich, white raiments, to mayst be clothed, and the same of the, <clears throat> and the shame of, um, the nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve, so that you may see. Uh, it is um, allegoric, symbolic expression. We understand these three elements are very important. The gold purified by fire have to do with our with the faith, the true faith, 
in Jesus Christ and also the white garment is the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eye salvo is a symbol of the Spirit of God. These three elements actually make the church alive, uh, make the church with Jesus uh, Christ. Uh, some comments on the Bible verses, Brother Henry Daring. So, Jesus, Jesus offers, offers all, all of these, these three things. elements, you know, taking the gold that tried by the fire. Uh, the church needs this gold, needs to be purified through the through temptations, through trials that we go through, produces faith, it produces more love. And of course, as you mentioned already, uh, the white raiment. Remember, the Laodiceans, the ancient Laodiceans, they produced black wool. And now Jesus is saying, I have something better. I'm producing white garments instead of black garments. And it, it was a beautiful message that came to the Adventist church in 1888, the message of Christ our righteousness. The message came very clearly to the pen of Ellen G. White, also what she said, and, and by Jones and Wagner, who were present at the Minneapolis conference. They offered the church the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the third element, to anoint the eyes with what I salve, that they could see. And that is, the Holy Spirit is what the church needs. Not so much theology, they need the simplicity of the gospel in their lives. They need the Holy Spirit. As well as, as, we, well could as say, we could say, having the Bible. The Bible. We, when we have the Bible, we read it, we read it our, eyesight our eyesight is open. Is open. We, read this we read this from the Spirit, the spirit of Prophecy, of prophecy writing the writings of L.N.G. White. White. Also, also, it gives, it gives us, light. us light. But if we, we do, do not, not study the Bible, the Spirit of Prophecy, and we're not led by the Holy Spirit, we'll walk in darkness. We will not be able to see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, here we have a testimony. And... Um, um, this is the testimony, testimony for the church, volume 1. I have on the screen just the first testimony, the second is the, the lesson also. But I would like to mention just a little part of it in the second line here. It says, uh, <clears throat> make some effort. It's part of the testimony. Make some effort. These precious treasuries will not drop upon us without some exhortation on our part. We must buy the zealous and repent, or our lukewarm of our lukewarm state. It's uh, it's obvious that the Lord actually expect from us from the church. Uh, answer. He expects from us to be ready. I understand that with our efforts we cannot obtain the righteousness of Christ. Either we can obtain the faith of the Holy Spirit with some kind of works or whatever. But also, if we do not desire, if we do not put things in practice in our life, and if we do not collaborate with Christ, uh, we need to understand that uh, this gift is not going uh, are not going to come to us uh, by force because God is not going to force us. He's uh, expecting from us to ask for it. Otherwise, uh, he will withhold this blessing. He will keep the blessing and we will be not able to uh, enjoy it. It is um, it's a very gladful and at the same time very sad message at the message to Laodicea. But uh, let's move now to question number four. And um, I would like that we change the slide. Uh, <clears throat> question number four. Here is it. How did Christ become judge of all mankind? Now, until now, until question number three, we have the faithful witness. Jesus Christ is a faithful witness. But now, in question number four, we are touching another subject, and that is Jesus Christ, our judge. Uh, we have three Bible verses, John 5, 
22, we have 26, 27, and also we have John 5, 30. Hey, Brother Henry Daring, would you love to, uh, to share with <coughs> some thoughts in regard with the question number four? Yes, not only is Jesus a faithful witness, a true witness, he's also a judge. He was appointed by God the Father. And God, Jesus knows the case of each individual. He lived on this earth as a man. He fought the battles of life. He was also victorious. He can do the job better than anybody else. He's skilled. He does professional work. He's sincere. And uh, he, knows, he knows the human heart. He knows exactly. And no one else can be this judge. No human being. No angel. Only Jesus Christ. He was appointed by the Father. He was given that authority to be the judge. Since he knows human weakness, he knows the positive things about people, he knows the negative things. So he's the perfect judge. And uh, he's faithful. We could also say he's a faithful judge. Not just a, a judge, but a faithful judge. Today in our society, we find a lot of judges are taking bribes who are involved in all kinds of scandals who cannot be trusted but with Jesus we can trust his work that he does we've seen it in the past he's always worked positively in favor of, of, of human beings thank you oh thank you very much very interesting uh, uh, perhaps a question can raise here uh, why is Jesus Christ presented as a judge? Is not the Father, uh, God Father, the judge? And we see in different places that the God Father appears as a judge. And it could be a certain confusion, considering also the Bible verses, John 5, 30, for example, says, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek no my own will, but the will of the Father. So, and also here the testimony, the Sire of Ages says, And God have given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. So we need to understand that when we talk about Jesus Christ being a judge, it doesn't mean that the Father is no longer a judge. Uh, God Father is the judge, but we see that also the Son is judge because the Father gave him this authority. And uh, I understand that some people can't think, but how is that possible? And uh, it's very possible because uh, if you have sin in some of the uh, of courts, some of very serious courts that takes place, around the world and in England for example or here also in the United States then not only one judge is proceeding but they are sitting a commission of judges sometimes uh, there are two judges sometimes there are three judges a part of the jury that is sitting in one place so <clears throat> they are also several judges operating and we can understand that the Father have given authority to the Son, as the testimony says here, also to be a judge. So it is not that the Son replaced the Father, but He judged with the Father. <clears throat> it is also, uh, let me show this um, testimony here on the screen. Here is it in the sign of ages. Um, and there is also another testimony here, testimony to the church, the last testimony. And Christ has been made our judge. The Father is, <clears throat> the angels are not. He who took humanity upon himself and this world lived in perfect life is to judge us. He only can be our judge. It's very important. The Father, uh, it trusts absolutely 
to his son and he gave in his hands the judgment upon the human race. Uh, <clears throat> some other comments, Brother Henry? Well, Jesus lived on this earth for 33 years. He has, has sufficient evidence, evidence what, what it is, is to, to go, go through, through trials, trials, what, what it, is it is to go through temptations. He, became, he had a dual nature, he had the divine nature as well as the human, human nature. nature. And he was, of course, crucified on a cross, so he has enough evidence. He understands the makeup of human beings. He knows the weaknesses of human beings, so he can be a fair judge. He has that experience, because he lived among human beings. So he can testify to his father, I've lived with these people. I understand them, and I have the evidence right before me. Because he was a living witness, seeing people fall into sin, like Mary Magdalene. He has seen many individuals who, Judas Iscariot also, he, he, he will judge Judas Iscariot. He, yes. He is right, right there. there. He was right, right there with, with humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Let's uh, consider now this, uh, uh, this uh, next question, which is question number five. First of all, what was the purpose of Jesus for mankind? And the second question here is, in reality, how does each individual judge himself? This is the point where the lesson can be applied in our personally life. And we have here the Bible verses in John 3, 17 and 18 and also John 12. Uh, 47 uh, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that he will through him may be saved he that believe on him is not condemned but he that believe not is condemned already because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God it is very important uh, uh, this uh, point of view uh, because we need to understand that it, God is not presented in the scriptures as an evil God that just go behind us and try to catch us in a mistake and try to get us in an error and then punish us and judge us as it is presented uh, uh, by many Christians and uh, and some churches like the Catholic Church, but uh, we understand that uh, Christ is a very loving God. And uh, in, this, uh, in this point we understand that the judgment actually, even before we came to the judgment, the judgment executes because of our own judgment, because of our own unbelief, we judge ourselves already. We already decide our destiny uh, by rejecting Christ. And that's how also uh, uh, Jesus interfered in our life and interfere in the judgment. And of course to those who he gave uh, his intercession, uh, they become ready for salvation. And those who... Christ do not accept uh, us to uh, such for uh, valuable for representation, they will not uh, be able to sustain themselves in the court. And from that point of view, Jesus is also an absolute, uh, absolute judge. We are judging first ourselves and those who doesn't accept him then Jesus does not represent in heaven and they automatically fail in that judgment. <clears throat> uh, Brother Henry Deering, some, uh, uh, some words from you on that question number five. Yeah, I, I, I like verse 17, John 3, 17, that Christ didn't come the first time to condemn anyone. He came to save people, to seek 
that they could have eternal life. That was his main reason. And of course, to glorify his Father. But he didn't come to judge people at that moment. It is the law of God, the Ten Commandments. That is the standard of the judgment. The law is going to condemn us. And uh, of course, when we reject Jesus Christ, we are condemning ourselves. But uh, Christ will reveal in the judgment, that is, that during the thousand years when the unrighteous are judged, all of the deepest secrets, every word that has been spoken, every action that has been taken by the ungodly will be revealed to the vast universe. But uh, so if, and, and during that time, there will be no appeal. It's today that we need to draw near to Jesus Christ and accept his, his love. love. He came he to, save to save us. us. He's, He's reaching, reaching down, down to us. us. All we have to do is reach up to Jesus and we will, we will be saved. As it says, he that believed on him is not condemned. It's a matter of believing. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. In the book of Acts it says it's a matter of believing. Of course, when we believe, we will be faithful to Jesus. We will keep all the Ten Commandments. And this is what God, what God expects, expects from us. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you very much. And maybe to close question five, here the, this tiny testimony, which is here. Uh, this is actually testimony number two. And the lesson, <clears throat> it's part of the Desire of Ages. In their attitude toward Christ, all worlds show on which side they stood. And this everyone passes judgment on himself. Uh, that means that in the moment we reject Christ, or if somebody rejects Jesus Christ, he automatically stays already on the side of the enemy, and that decides his destiny for eternal life. It's incredible uh, how uh, just and how merciful the Lord is. He's not Actually, in, in, the, in the end of the whole things, it's not that he judge us. We actually judging ourselves uh, by our own election uh, and by our own desire to whom we want to serve. Um, it's very interesting. We would like to go forwards and to the next undertitle. Now, Jesus, our advocate. He's our judge but he's also our advocate. I don't know how uh, I could imagine that for some people could be difficult to imagine how could Jesus Christ be at the same time judge, advocate, and uh, he's our representatives, he's our substitute, he's like everything and that whole process of salvation. But uh, here question number six is very clear. A sinner um, accused by Satan before God, uh, whom can we choose to defend us? A sinner accused by Satan before God, whom can we choose to defend us? Brother Henry Deering, how do you understand this mystery, how Jesus Christ is at the same time our advocate and he's also our judge. And how is uh, how do you understand it? Let's try to get some light on that mystery. Well, well the Jesus, Jesus has different, different positions. positions. He has three, three different, different positions, positions according, according to this slide. And it's like, it's like somebody, somebody working, working in a corporation. In a corporation. They also they have three different, different positions. So working in a general, general conference. conference. Somebody, somebody could be, be vice president, president, could also be, be the secretary, and, and also have another position. All positions work together. They work in harmony. And, and of course, at different time periods. All right, thousands of years ago, uh, we go we back, back four or five thousand, thousand years, years ago, ago there was not actually Jesus as an advocate. That occurred when he ascended. He went into the holy, he became an advocate. And, and, then, he, and then, then he went into, into the most holy, holy. he became our high priest. 
during this time of investigative judgment. So he, he carries different responsibilities, but Jesus is the one who will defend us. It's true we sin, and Satan accuses us. It accuses us before God. He says, that brother, that sister has lied, has committed this sin or that sin. And uh, that, that's a fact. Christ says, yes, yes that's, that's true. true. So and so, so, so it commits these sins. sins. But he raises Christ his hands. He said, my blood that was shed on Calvary, he has accepted this sinner. And I will absolve him. I will forgive him of all sins. So it's through the blood of Jesus Christ that we are forgiven. We can sin, but we're also forgiven. So we have a wonderful uh, uh, advocate. He intercedes on our behalf, and he's never, never lost a case. He does this freely through his grace. But we have to go to him and ask him, will you be my advocate? We have to go to him. And he's, he's pleading for us day by day, but the day will come. He will no longer be an advocate, and he will take on that role as a, a judge, and, and then we will all be condemned because we're all broken the law of God. Thank you. That's right. Thank you. That's right. I can imagine that many people from the world will say, but how that, if he, he's a judge, an advocate, he surely will, uh, will judge for his own case because, because it's, uh, um, uh, you know, he is like, uh, it, uh, he has the, the whole power about the whole things, but we need to understand that since he's God, he cannot act dishonestly. He cannot, he cannot judge falsely. It is impossible to to even think about any uh, any way of corruption in the heavenly court because that will be known immediately of all the heavenly beings, and the authority of the divinity will be destroyed. The whole a power and the throne of God will lose uh, their reputation. It's impossible to that uh, any shadow, any uh, even the minimum thought of unrighteousness to enter in this. Uh, and when you mention about uh, different position, I really remember a very strange case that's happened to me. I was a secretary and uh, vice, vice president of the general conference at the same time I was the local pastor of the church. And as a local pastor, I was under the responsibility of the field leader. And I have to call him and ask for permission for different things. And I was thinking, oh, wow, now I really have to change my hats and, uh, and show a good example because I cannot you know, <clears throat> react like, a, you know, authoritarily in that case. And I have to ask for permission if we can do committee meeting and if we have to have the Holy Supper and I have to uh, follow the working plan that have been set up and all these kind of things. So it's very interesting how also in our life we can have different positions and Jesus Christ has that in his heavenly court. Uh, we would like to move forwards and <laughs> let's go to the next uh, next slide and see question number seven. Question number seven. <clears throat> How can the repentant sinner approach the throne of grace? How can the repentant sinner approach the throne of grace? That is a very important question. It's also related to us. It's a very personal uh, question. We need to apply that in our life. We need to turn now the whole lesson about the heavenly judgment into the practical life because that's how the lesson really become useful for our members and visitors. This is why I told you from the beginning, leave time for the last questions because they are very important. How can we, how can a repentant sinner approach the throne of grace? Brother Henry Deering, what do you think about this important question? 
to, to come to the Father, we go through Jesus Christ, and it's a matter of faith. We need the faith to believe that Christ is in the most holy today. He is our advocate. He's pleading on our behalf. He's forgiving all of our sins, but we have to repent. We have to forsake our sins. And the Bible says, let us come boldly. Don't, don't be afraid. Sometimes we commit a sin and we, we are afraid. God isn't going to forgive us those sins because we've committed the sin over and over again. No, go boldly. Don't be ashamed. Uh, if we're ashamed, then, then we cannot be forgiven. But go, because there's mercy. There's mercy at the end of the road. There's forgiveness. And God will always, always forgive us. Of course, we know, unless we commit the sin against the Holy Spirit. But while there's hope, while we're living in this world, Christ, our advocate, will forgive us of any sin. And what's remarkable, those sins will be cast into the depths of the sea, and they will no longer be remembered. So this is the God that I serve, and he's a wonderful Savior. He's died for me personally, and I, I want to follow him until the very end. And we know that Probation will soon come to an end. Christ will no longer remain in the most holy. He will step out, and then the seven last plates will be poured out. So we have very little time, my dear brothers and sisters, very little time to, to turn our hearts completely to Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Henry Daring. Uh, very important comments. Uh, I think that... Uh, uh, we can also present this uh, Bible verse from the other point of view. It says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. Uh, <clears throat> we, need to, um, we need to experience the repentance in order that we qualify for the grace of God. That is very clearly here expressing the testimony <clears throat> it says you are to come to God as a repenting sinner through the name of Jesus the divine advocate to a merciful forgiving father believing that he will do just as he hath promised it's very important to understand how uh, the repentance practically is the the quality or the qualification that's or, or that's make us qualified for that uh, for that mercy and if a person like uh, I'm remember I remember now the parable about the publican and uh, um, a Pharisee and the Pharisee he was knowledgeable man of the law but uh, he was so proud he didn't ask for forgiveness he didn't repent of everything and anything. He just uh, thank God that he's so good and he's so wonderful. And it says that he went in his house and he was not forgiven. But the publican that feel sinner, he feel bad because of his uh, transgressions. He ask of forgiveness. He experienced this experience of uh, uh, he had this experience of uh, repentance he feel the pain of the sin and what the parable say he went home forgiven he went home forgiven and that's the point sometimes uh, brothers and sisters comes and say I brother I feel so bad why you're so bad because I have transgressed and this and I'm not a good Christian, and, and I, I usually answer, as long as you feel like you say you're saved. But when you begin to feel that you're so very good Christian, that, there is a, uh, <clears throat> that, you, have, that you don't sin anymore, and you don't transgress anything, that is something that we need to worry about. And that is what the lesson is here about. We need to experience the repentance and then when we approach the throne of grace, we surely indeed will receive uh, this wonderful forgiveness and participation of the protection of the Advocate. Brother Henry Daring, something else to add to that? 
Well, questions? Well, yes, yes. Something, Something short. short. The work, the work of repentance is the work of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. We, we cannot, cannot just, just repent on our own. own. It must be Christ within us, the Holy Spirit within us, to urge us to feel sorry for what we have done wrong. Everything is the work of God. We just merely need to submit to, to, to Jesus Christ and let him lead our lives. We have, to, we have to go to Jesus Christ. Again, only by faith. Without faith, we cannot please God. We need the faith, and uh, again, yeah, that, that comes, comes from, from the Holy Spirit, Spirit also. So we, we just, just have to seek for it. We need to go to, go to the throne of grace, of grace. Uh, otherwise, otherwise we are, we are all, all doomed. doomed. So, it's, so it's Christ is the, is the one that's going to help us to be saved. saved. And we, we need, need to draw near, near to him more than ever before in this turbulent, stressful time in Earth's history. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, very important, dear brothers and sisters. Let's understand also repentance is not fruit of the flesh. Repentance is the fruit of the spirit. But we need to agree. We need to be not comfortable with the sin. We need to uh, seek uh, the spirit of God. We need to seek the ways of the Lord. And then the Lord will intervene in our lives. Hey, don't be discouraged, brothers and sisters. Uh, there is uh, always... Uh, temptations and the road. The devil is uh, very eager to tempt us all the time, but if we are also faithful to repent and to go to Jesus Christ, we have a faithful advocate to defend us. Amen. Amen. Going to the question of the, to the testimony of the meditation, it is a <clears throat> Uh, don't forget to consider these testimonies because you can use them also when you are um, uh, teaching in the lesson. Let me switch here to the meditation. Uh, <clears throat> and we have here a nice testimony, God's Amazing Grace, page uh, 174. By his spotless life, his obedience, his death on the cross and Calvary, Christ intercede for the lost race. And now, not as more petitioner, that's the captain of the salvation, intercede for us, but as a conqueror claiming his victory. And I think this testimony is so important because otherwise we perhaps have difficult to understand how Jesus Christ, he is the judge, he is the advocate, he is the, the whole things. Why? Because of the victory. Actually, the victory is gained by Jesus Christ in the cross. When he died and after the cross, when the Father accepted his sacrifice, actually the payment was done. Everything was decided. And actually he's not trying to do something now or to begin doing something now. He's just claiming the reward for that that have been already done. And that is... Uh, um, what Jesus have done for us and this is why he is the judge also and he is our advocate and he's everything this testimony enlightened very well um, this topic and perhaps that will help us so that brothers and sisters don't enter in confusion we would like also to move forwards and see uh, <clears throat> the study for personal study we have here two testimony <coughs> the message to the church of Laodicean is a, a startling denunciation and is applicable to the people of God at the present time I remember this testimony was given in uh, an 18 63 when sister white for first time says that the message of laodicea is related to the present time because many of the 
Adventist pioneers believe the Laodicea is not a message for them. The Laodicea message is uh, or applies to uh, the other churches, the fallen churches. Uh, but uh, the Lord revealed Sister White that 1863, and we know 1888, Pastor Henry Deering just mentioned uh, how uh, exactly that come to fulfillment, Christ our righteousness, the message was rejected. <clears throat> Uh, the a second testimony says, while those addressing are flattering themselves that they are an exultant spiritual condition, the message of the true witness breaks their security by the startling denunciation of their true condition of spiritual blindness, poverty, and wretchedness. This is another testimony that can be used and the questions to um, clarify certain points, why this uh, happened. And uh, uh, it's happened because of uh, uh, our proudness, says the testimony. The proudness of knowledge, the proudness of this special truth that made us so important, made us so different from the other uh, illuminations. Uh, but, uh, dear brothers and sisters, I think we shall not forget to mention also the reward to the Church of Laodicea. It says in the further verses in Revelation uh, 3 that those who overcome, they will sit on the throne uh, of Jesus Christ. It says, Jesus Christ, I will give them to sit in my throne, and so as I overcome and sit in the throne, of my father. Imagine what kind of great privilege we have. What do you say, Brother Henry, as a conclusion of that lesson? Yes, 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 yes but I, 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 I pray, pray and, and hope, hope that, that we will, we will all examine, examine our hearts, hearts to, to see, see our, our true spiritual, spiritual condition, condition, that, that we're, we're not blind, blind to the reality that we are weak and that we need Christ. And, and I, I pray, pray that, that we will not be in a lukewarm condition. We need to make a decision. Either we're hot or cold. And my desire is that we're all hot, that we're zealous for Jesus Christ. This is this is the true condition we need to be in. If we're lukewarm, 50-50, God will spew us out. But we need to be hot. I pray that we will all repent today. Thank you. Amen, amen. Dear brothers and dear sisters, um, this lesson is a wonderful uh, encouragement for all of us. Our Lord Jesus Christ is our advocate. He's our witness, but he's also the judge in heaven. So we have no way to doubt that our case can be brought successfully if we just be faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be discouraged. Confess your sin. Repent yourself. Go to Christ. A salvation is sure indeed, and we have nothing to doubt. May the Lord bless you and have a blessed Sabbath day. Amen. Amen.